Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we would look at the estate tax, a topic that's covered in a corporate income tax course as well as the CPA regulation section and the EA exam. As always, I would like to remind you to connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't done so. YouTube is where you would need to subscribe. I have 1,600 plus accounting, auditing, tax, and finance lectures. If you like my lectures, please like them. Click on the like button. It doesn't cost you anything. Share them. Put them in playlist. If they benefit you, it means they might benefit other people. And please connect with me on Instagram. My website, you will find additional resources on farhatlectures.com where you can supplement your education, your CPA preparation with exercises through false multiple choice. And if you are studying for the CPA exam, 2000 plus CPA questions. So I'm going to start this session by going over uh, the overall picture about the transfer tax, which is composed of the estate tax and the gift tax. They're kind of connected in one way or another. We're going to see how later the estate tax is imposed on the decedent's entire estate. And this is the tax on the right to pass property at death. Basically, after you died, this is when, this is when the estate tax kicks in. The gift tax is, is called an inter vivos or lifetime transfer for less than full consideration basically you are giving gift and you are not expecting anything in return and you expect to pay taxes on those gifts and we looked at the gift tax in the prior session so that's that's done now we're going to talk about the estate tax matter of fact i'll put the description for the link for the gift tax because somehow they're going to be not somehow they're going to be related okay so it's very important to understand the gift tax i'm going to start by go, going over some terms with the estate tax uh, you may or may not see them before but they're very important uh, for this session for example the decedent is the person who dies beneficiary is the person who receives the decedent's property so if you are the beneficiary of your decedent uncle your uncle passed away they left some property for you that's good gross estate is the older property owned by an individual and we're going to focus this session specifically on the gross estate how we compute this what is a will a will is a document that details how an estate is to be distributed disseminated and bequeath is the transfer of property after that so you'll be happy when you were bequeathed something so somebody gave you something because they passed away and I'm going to start this session by looking at the state tax formula because it's very important to look at the overall picture. Then we're going to start to drill within each line in the formula. So the first thing we do is we compute the fair market value of the gross estate. And I'm going to call it here line one. And I'm going to, I'm going to be refer, referring to this as line one. So this is line one. Um, the fair market value of the gross estate. Then we're going to deduct the expenses, losses, and deductions, which is line two. I will have line two for a separate session. So I'm going to focus on this line for now line one minus line two will give you the taxable estate then we're going to add to the taxable estate any taxable gift this is one going to consider line four and we already we already learned about the taxable gift if not go to the tax gift that's why they are connected that's equal to a state tax basis then we're going to compute our tentative tax liability then we're going to deduct any taxes paid on gift post-1976 gift. Then we're going to take the unified tax credit, which as we talked about in the gift tax. Then we might take other credits, if any available. Then we're going to get to the estate tax too. So this is the complete formula. Obviously, eventually we'll work a complete example illustrating this formula, but we're going to be focusing on line one. So let's take a look at line one. What is the gross estate? Basically, the gross estate is everything that you own at death. A hat, a boat, your investments, your car, your clothes, your vehicle, your jewelry, your furniture, all of these is part of your estate. Okay, so we're going to look at the fair market value of all property owned by the decedent, decedent at the date of death or an alternative valuation date. I will talk about this alternative valuation date later on at the end of the session. That include personal effects, jewelry, furniture, stocks, bonds, investments, right to receive dividends or interest if they accrued at the date of death. So as long as they accrued at the date of death, especially interest, then you are entitled. Uh, for the dividend, there is no accrual. As long as they are declared, then you are entitled. You're not you. You, you. The person will be gone. The estate of that individual. The value of business owned by the decedent. You can own. Uh, you could have a. You could be a partner. Um, 
and an LLC, LLP, you could have your own business, the value of that business, the proportionate value of any asset owned by a decedent and any other person if both parties pay. So if you are a co-owner with someone, for example, if a decedent jointly own a boat with his son, both parties paid one half, so therefore one half of the value of that boat will go into your estate because you paid half of it and you own it. Okay. Now, we have something called revocable trust. What are revocable trust? Remember what we talked when we talked about gift. If you gifted something, if you gifted something, it means you're transferred without any adequate consideration and it's gone. It's no longer part of your estate. However, we have something called revocable trust. Maybe you, you would you would create a trust, but you still control that trust. Those are called incomplete transfer. So if you have a complete transfer, you don't have to worry about it. If it's a complete transfer, then it's part of your gift when you were alive. But if you made an incomplete transfer, that's going to be included in your gross estate. Okay? What could be an incomplete transfer? A revocable transfer. If you put something in an estate for someone, but you would maintain the power of changing the beneficiary to terminate this trust, to change it, to revoke it, to terminate it. If you have any power over the trust, it's called a revocable trust. If it's a revocable trust, you did not really transfer it to that individual. Therefore, it's going to be part of your estate. So if, if it says revocable trust, it's going to be included in your estate. Okay. What happens if the decedent releases the revocation? You change your mind. Well, if you do so, here are the rules. You have to do it three years before you die. Now, how would you know? You never know. But as long as you revoked it and you lived an additional three years, then the revocation is complete. Otherwise, if you died three years, uh, within three years, then the trust will go into your estate. So it's, it's very interesting. And the same concept would apply if you retain life estate. So if you put an asset away and you kept using it, it's for your own use. Well, same thing, unless you release the, re the retention. If you re the retention should be released again, three years before the death. So, so if it's not a complete transfer, it's, it's going to go in your gross estate. Let's take a look at a few examples just to see how this whole thing works. In 2000, Rita created an unrevocable trust, a revocable trust with securities worth 900000 But here's what happened. It's irrevocable. However, Rita retained a life estate. So what does that mean? What is retain a life estate? Because we mentioned this term here. Retain life estate. It means she can use she can use it as long as she is alive, as long as she's alive. But once she passes away, the remainder goes to her children. So it's irrevocable. Simply put, it's irrevocable. So he said, if it's irrevocable, it should be out of her, out of her uh, uh, estate. Well, she retained a life estate. So she said, okay, I'm not gonna, I can't change anything, but as long as I'm living, I'm gonna use it. Okay. Now here we go. In 2000, created a life estate. The Benny is herself. She's the beneficiary. Why? Because she's using the estate. It's a retained life estate. This is what it retained life estate. Retained life estate is incomplete transaction, incomplete transfer. Therefore, there is no gift. Here she did not make any gift. What does that mean? There is no gift. If something happened to her, let's, she, let's assume she passed away, it's going to be included in her gross estate. Okay. Now, two years later, or 12 years later, Rita released the retention on her life estate when the trust asset now have 1.5 million in value. Now, it's irrevocable, we already determined this, and it's irrevocable, and she released the retention of her life estate. Simply put, it, uh, it's no longer mine. I'm not, I'm not gonna be using this. Well, now there is, there is a gift, okay? Rita, released, uh, Rita releases the retention, the transaction was complete, Thus, it's a gift to her children. Now, there's a gift, and the value of the gift is 1.5 million. So, it was not gift in 2000 because she retained a life estate. As long as she's living, she can use it. Then, it's not a gift. Now, it's a gift. Let's assume Rita dies in 2012 when the trust asset have a fair market value of 2 million. What are Rita's transfer tax in 2014? Guess what? Because she released it and she died within three years. Remember, she released it in 2012. She dies in 2014. It's going to go back and be included in her gross estate. Now, that's no longer a gift. It's going to be included in her gross estate because she releases the retention within three years. The fair market value of two million goes back in her gross estate. Let's assume she passed away in 2016. Now it's over three years since she, over three years because 2016, 
20, 2016 is within outside the three year period. If that's the case, if that's the case, you remember she released in 2012, she didn't die until 20, 2016, then in that case, it's not a problem. Not, none of the 1.8 is included in her gross estate because she simply gifted them. She simply gifted them, okay? Um, so revocable trust is something that you have to be, you know, have to be concerned about. Another issue that comes up is life insurance. Well, you have to know that the life insurance, the gross proceeds, including uh, the gross estate includes the life insurance. And usually that's a large trunk, chunk for a lot of people because that's what they do. They buy life insurance. That's how they maintain their wealth and the wealth to protect the wealth of, for their loved ones. Okay. Now, if the individual transferred the policy three years before death, it's included in the gross estate. So if you try to get rid of it three years before, before you die, it's included. Okay. So life insurance, if you buy life insurance on the life of another person, so notice here what's happening. You buy the insurance on the life of another person. So life insurance of, an, of another owned by a descendant at the time of death is included in the gross estate as the asset owned by the descendant. Okay, now the amount, it's not going to be the full amount because it did not mature. The amount includable is the replacement value. Let's take a look at an example because it did not mature. So let's take a look at an example. At the time of his death, Luigi owned a life insurance policy on the life of Benito. So if something happened to Benito, somebody's going to be paid and it's going to be paid half a million. The replacement value is 50,000 and Sophia is going to be paid. So if something happened to Benito, Sophia will be paid half a million dollars. Right now, the value of the policy, the replacement value, which is the cash value, is 50000 So if they cancel it today, it's only 50000 Because the policy has not matured as at Luigi's death, so Luigi died, what's going to happen? Only the 50000 which is the replacement policy, will be included in Luigi's gross estate. So notice he bought the policy. He's the buyer. But on the life of Benito, and Sophia is going to get the money if something happened to Benito. So under those circumstances, Luigi died. It did not mature. We only put the replacement policy. I see this question on the CPA exam. Just, just know the policy. So you're the owner, but you're not the beneficiary. Okay, it's, it's interesting. Um, if the owner retain any incident of ownership, so if incident of ownership in the policy exists, the policy is included in the, in the estate in the estate of the decedent. So if you have a policy that you, you you control that policy, okay? Um, as long as you have some control of the policy, it's included, okay? At the time of the death, B was the was the insured under a policy of a million dollar owned by Gregory with Demi as a designated beneficiary. Now B is the insured, took out the policy five years ago. He, he took out the policy and immediately transferred it as a gift to Gregory. So he bought it and he transferred it as a gift. Under the assignment, B, transfer all the rights of the policy except the right to change the beneficiary. What happened here is the, he did not really give up everything because he kept this right to change the beneficiary. B died without having exercised this right. It doesn't matter whether he exercised the right or not. The policy proceeds are paid to Demi. Okay, the, he died, the policy proceeds of Edeni. B, retention of, of the incident of ownership of that, uh, of that policy will be included, causes the $1 million to be included in his gross estate, even though he never exercised that right. So because he, he kept the right to change the beneficiary, when, you know, when it paid out, it goes to his estate. So $1 million is assuming it's, it's under his control, causes the $1 million to be included in his in his estate. So if you don't want it, just make sure you don't have any incidents of ownership. Otherwise, the value will be included in your estate. Also, under certain conditions, the death of the insured may constitute a gift to the Benny on the on a to the Benny of part of all of or all the proceeds. Let's take a look at an example to see how this works. This occurs when the owner of the policy is not the insured person. So let's take a look at this. Randolph owned an insurance policy on the life of Frank. So he owns the policy and the life of Frank, and Tracy is the, is the designated beneficiary. Up until the time of Frank's death, Randolph retained the right to change the beneficiary of the policy. The proceeds paid to Tracy by the insurance company. Now here's what happened. Let me just kind of... So we have Randolph, and he bought the policy against Frank. 
but the payout will go to Tracy to T. So when the payout happened, it's considered a gift from R to T. It's a gift from R to T. So, so the proceeds paid to Tracy by the insurance company by reason of Frank's death, Frank's die, but Dro Rodolph owns the insurance policy. Basically, it's a gift from, it's considered a gift from Randolph to Tracy. Now, what does that mean? It means he, Randolph will have to include that in his uh, uh, tax, uh, tax gift. Let's take a look at joint interest. Joint interest is mean when, when you own a piece of property with someone else. Now, you could own that piece of property with your spouse, or you could own it with your friends, with your brother, with your buddy, with anyone. So there are different rules or different terminology that you need to be familiar with, whether you own the property with a non-spouse, with somebody other than your spouse, or whether you own it with you. It's a spousal joint property. So under non-spousal, we have two categories. You could own something as a joint tenancy. And here, how do you know it's a joint tenancy? Well, when you bought this asset, your lawyer and their lawyer and your friend agree to be joint tenancy. But what does that mean? It means the decedent's interest automatically transfer to the surviving owner. So if you, if you own, uh, own a property that joint tenancy, guess what? You die the property goes to your friend, to your brother, whoever whoever owns it. But you have no control over that. Okay, so it's included in the decedent's gross estate during the inclusion formula. Using the inclusion formula, what's the inclusion formula? We're going to look at the inclusion formula in a moment. But it goes to your to the other person, so you have no control. If the ownership is tenants in common, not joint tenancy. Now we're talking about tenants in common. That's different. Now, the decedent can pass the property to whoever they want to, because it's, let's assume they own 25%. Well, it doesn't go automatically to your brother or to your buddy or to your friend. You decide. So it's includable in the decedent's gross estate using the percentage. If 25% of the fair market value goes to your goes to your gross estate. Now here you have control. It doesn't go automatically to the other person. You decide where does this property go. Now. Ownership with your spousal is a little bit different. It's called tenant by entirety. And basically what does that mean? It means half of the property, fair market value included in the gross estate of the first spouse to die. So you and your spouse, one of one of you passes away, the property goes to the others, to the surviving spouse. So the decedent interest also automatically, you have no choice, transferred to the surviving spouse, spouse using the marital deductions. What's gonna happen? It transferred, then through the marital deduction, you will see later it will be deducted, okay? An example of a joint uh, a joint tenancy or joint interest or joint ownership is an annuity. And what is an annuity? It's a stream of payment extended over a period of time. What is an annuity and how is it used? It's it's basically used once people get closer to retirement. What they do? They sell all their asset and they buy a policy to pay them money. Basically, this is what uh, what an annuity is: a policy to pay you money basically what they do is they will sell everything and they would say i want to be paid for the next you know 120 month or 240 month for example agreement of five thousand dollar every month so that's the agreement so you buy a policy you pay an amount here you sell all your asset and you let's assume you pay a million dollar just make it up and you have the right to receive that money so it's a so it's a, it's an investment okay so this is what an annuity is. We have two types of annuities. One is called straight life. And this one is pretty straightforward. Basically, once you die, once you, that's it, it stops. Okay, so nothing to worry about here because if it stops, we don't have to worry about your gross estate. Then we have a survivorship annuity, and this is different. This survivorship annuity either starts after you die or keeps going after that, depending on, depending on the agreement. But the point is we have to know what's going to happen what amount do we need to include in the decedents here we have to use what's called the inclusion formula to determine how much to include in the decedent estate so how much to include in the decedent estate now the decedents formula is something like this it's decedent contribution how much did they contributed how much they contributed i'm pretty sure we covered this basic formula in the past divided by the cost so what is your what is your ownership level how much did you contributed Okay, let's assume you contributed $100 and the total cost was 1000 Well, you contributed 10%. So this is what we're saying here. Then we multiply this percentage by the fair market value of that annuity. 
and that's the amount that you would include that's it's as simple as that not as simple but that's how you do it so let's take a look at an example to see how it works when when it comes to an annuity okay so in 1990 Alan and his longtime girlfriend, Kate, purchased a commercial single premium annuity. So they purchased an annuity. The total cost was 100000 Alan paid 60000 and Kate paid forty. So the ownership is 60 -40. Under the terms of the policy, Alan and Kate are to receive 50000 annually for life starting in 2010. So that's, 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 that's the payout. Okay? So every year they'll pay them 50000 until they die. When one person died, the survivor is to receive 25000 annually for life. So the, the benefit will transfer to the other person, 25000 for life. In 2000, Alan married Kate. Now they're married. In 2016, Alan dies first. So six, year, six years later, Alan died. At time of his death, the survivorship feature of genuity is worth 400000 So it's valued at 400000 How did we know this? It's given. They, they're telling us. The value of the annuity is 400000 basically the present value of the future cash flow. So the first question is, how much was Alan's gift to Kate in 2000? Because in 2000, they got married. And remember, Alan owns 60% initially and Kate owns 40%. What happened is when they get married, they have ownership of 50-50. What does that mean? It means Alan gave up 10000 or 10% and gave it to Kate. So that's a gift. Okay. So, Alan initially owns 60% and Kate 40%. In 2000, Alan and Kate are married. The ownership becomes 50-50. Thus, the gift was made when they, married was when, they, when they married in 2000. So, what's the amount of the gift? Again, 60,000 minus 50. Alan's gift to Kate is 10,000. Okay? In 2016, how much is included in Alan's gross estate? In what happened in 2016? In 2016... He passed away. So how much is included in his gross estate? Now we have to go back and compute the formula using this formula up here. Okay, remember the value was 400,000. We are giving the value when he passed when he passed away. The value is 400,000. So we're going to take the, um, the amount that Alan contributed, 60,000 divided by 10 times 400,000. And that, that amount is 240,000. Now, the question is how much he would include in his estate. Well, he's going to include 240000 And what's going to happen, we're going to turn around and deduct 240 for marital deduction because she's going to get it. Okay. So the 240 is automatically passed to Kate. Okay. So simply put, we're going to say it's 240000 included. Then we're going to learn in the next session about marital deduction. Then we deduct 240. Therefore, the taxable estate is nothing. The net amount is nothing because you're going to include 240. Then it's going to go to his wife. Remember, remember what we talked about when it comes to your wife. You don't have an option. It automatically goes to the wife. You will include it in the gross estate, then you will deduct it. Basically, the net is zero. The net is the net amount is zero. Let's take a look at another joint ownership situation. We have Keith and Steve, father and son, acquired a tract of land with ownership listed as a joint tenancy. Let's go back to joint tenancy. This is not husband and wife. This is father and son joint tenancy. What does that mean? It's when when one person die, right here, one person die, it goes to the other person. Okay, so you know what it is before we proceed. Um, Keith, the father, furnished 400000 Keith furnished 400000 And Steve furnished 200000 to purchase it. Of the 200 that Steve furnished, 100 has been received as a gift from his father. So technically, his father paid 500000 The property was worth 900000 Keith died. The father died. Because only 1,000 of Steve's contribution can be counted, Steve has furnished only one six, which is 100,000. The son furnished 100,000, one six of the cost. What's going to happen now? We have to include five six of the cost, which is 900 times five six, in the father's estate. And this result presumes that Steve can prove that he did, in fact, made the 100,000 contribution. In the absence of such proof, the full value is included in his father's estate. So as long as he can show that, yeah, I, I made those, this 100,000, I saved it over the years, and when I bought this land, here's my bank account, and here's my check, that's it, then that's the case. 
the what we need to look at too is the valuation date when do we value the asset well the valuation date is determined at the date of death or an alternative valuation date avd what is that alternative valuation date six months after death or the date of the disposition within six months so if you sold something within six months well we know when we cash something we know the value okay so to collect to not to collect to choose the alternative valuation date that date must reduce the gross estate and the estate tax liability. So simply put, what you're hoping is, it's, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, is when you pass away, when a person passes away, and if, if they choose the alternative valuation date, is, it means they are hoping that the value of the asset goes down. The value of the asset goes down. Why? Because if the value of the asset goes down, they will choose that six months later. If, let's assume we're talking about stocks and bonds. You want the stocks and bonds to go down in value. Why? Because when you value the estate, if it's lower, then you pay less taxes. It's kind of counterintuitive. Counter yes, but that's how it is. Let's take a look at a quick example to see how it works. Robert Gross Estates consists of the following land. We have the value at the date of death and the value six months later. 14, uh, 14 million eight hundred. The six months later, fourteen million eight hundred and forty stocks in Brown Company nine hundred thousand. The value is lower at six months later, and stock in Green Corporation the value is lower as well. So here's the total sixteen point two million. Six months later, sixteen million. Now, if Roberts exec, ex, execute, executor elects the alternative valuation date, the estate must value it at sixteen million. It's not permissible to value the land at the date of death, which is lower, and choose the alternative valuation date. It's either for all, unless you sold those assets, one of those assets during the during the year. Now, this is basically, I looked at the gross estate. What's included in the gross estate? And basically, going back to what we started with, that is line one. That's, that's, why, that's why I went over line one. In the next session, I will work a quick example illustrating line one, then, I would go into line two, you know, which is expenses, losses, and deduction, which include the marital deduction. As always, I would like to remind you, if you like this recording, please click on the like button, subscribe, share it with others. Also, if you are interested, if you are studying for your CPA exam and interested in supplementary material, visit my website. You study for your CPA once for 20, 30 years, make it worth it. Pass, move on. That's what you need to do. Study hard, good luck, and usually this topic is not taught very well in colleges and universities, so hopefully I did help you clarify this topic. Good luck and study hard.